if you have a Bible, would you go ahead and turn it, or open, turn it on? Well, depending on what kind of Bible you brought, somehow get to Acts 3. <laughs> somehow get to Acts 3. <laughs> if, if, if you are visiting with us today, again, we're, we're really thankful that you're with us. Um, we have been in this vision series is we're, we're at that point where it's time for us to, to look at uh, building a building and we've been moving towards uh, Commitment Sunday, which is today as we uh, commit and then we, we get going as far as um, the direction that God would have us to, to build over in Hartman Crossing. But before we, before we build, we've been working to try to make sure that the vision of the church aligns with the church that's presented in the New Testament um, because they give us the pattern, therefore, our, our task isn't to reinvent that. Our task is to, to follow with what God has already set out. And so we've been looking at this and, and seeing how really in the past few weeks, how God does extraordinary ministry through ordinary folks, um, how because of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, uh, we're united together. And then he gives us gifts and he gives us purpose to, 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 to do the task that he's, he's given us, this, this, this work that he's given us. Oh, you, you'll hear in church circles folks talk about fellowship. That's not a potluck. Really, fellowship is when we come together when we're working, when we're working towards that same, that same goal. And when the, church is, when the church is doing it right, fellowship is real. Scripture is at the center of what's happening. God's presence is experienced. Generosity is flowing. That's how the church works right. We talked about even when difficult times come, what, what do we do? We, we saw that the way the first church, they trusted in the sovereignty of God. And they just, when, when bad stuff happened, they started praying, recognizing that God was in control. And then, and then they focused on the gospel because this goes out. And then their only request was, God, give me the guts to do what you've called me to do. Help us to, to, to be the church that you'd have for us. Remember this, this promise, that's what scripture says, is this promise is for us and for our kids and for all those who are far off from the Lord our God may call. So we've been focusing on that and today as uh, we, we get ready to take those next steps as a church, I'm going to look at one last, one last text here. Uh, so it's Acts 3. I'm going to read this, this passage. If, if, if you're unfamiliar with it, hear it like you've heard it for the first time. We'll, we'll get at it here. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple for the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. A man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple a gate called Beautiful, so he could beg from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he, he asked for money. Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, hey, look, look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from him, but Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. Then, taking him by the right, uh, right hand, he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and started to walk, and he entered the temple with him, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized that he was the one who used to sit in bed at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. So they were filled with awe and astonishment of what had happened to him. Uh, while he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astonished, ran towards them in what's called the uh, Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, fellow Israelites, why are you amazed at this? Why do you stare at us as though we made him walk by our own power or godliness? We're, we're, we're going to stop right there because Peter goes on with this incredible sermon where he just talks about, hey, this is Jesus that, that did this. But we need to stop for a minute and let's just recap what happened here. It's easy to read Bible stories and read them like they're stories and not recognize this is a real guy. This is a real man. He's not just a character in a story. He grew up in a family just like you and me. 
We don't know his name. We don't know anything about him. Other, he's identified by his condition. That's all we know about him. And he's brought to the temple. Would you show a picture of the temple? This is, um, actually, this is in Jerusalem. They've, they've rebuilt it because that's not there any longer. Uh, today, the, the Dome of the Rock sits there in the middle. But if you look at that picture in the, the middle of what, what's called the Holy of Holies, and that's, you know, the, the one high priest can go there once a year. Just around that would be uh, where the priests could go. Just outside of that is where the Jewish men could go. And then outside of that wall, just outside that is where the Jewish gals could go. And then all the way around the outside edge is what they, they'd call the, the court of the Gentiles. That's where those who had come to faith but weren't born Jews could go. So remember, the temple is a series of, hey, you, you can't go any further. It's, 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 a, it's a series of, you don't belong any further. That's, that's really what that amounts to. It's enormous. That's where we're, we're, we're seated. And if you look um, to the left, you'll see that area where there seems to be something built on top of it. That outside gate's most likely where this happened. That outside gate's where he would have been sitting. And then this in, the, the wall closest to the, the front of the screen there, or the front of the picture, the inside of that's what's called Solomon's Colonnade. Just so we can see this happen, where it started and where it ended. He's at that gate, but he can't go in. He's not allowed in, honestly. Um, his condition not only keeps him from earning a living, but it keeps him from joining the community in worship. It keeps him distance. He hears prayers. He hears the songs. He sits at the gate because he is separated by every measurable means. Everything about this guy says he's not allowed to go any further. He is both dependent and distanced. And honestly, I imagine that the time had long passed where he'd just been angry, and now he's just settled into the dullness of his existence. As he sits, uh, you can see him in your mind, sitting on a mat with a cardboard sign, Right? He can't move. He can't go anywhere. They had to carry him there, just hoping for enough food to get him you know, through another day. As two men walk by. They clearly weren't wealthy. They're dressed like simple country folks, because honestly, that's what they are. Peter and John, fishermen by trade. They're heading up to pray, and just maybe they'll care. Maybe they'll have some compassion. Maybe they'll, they'll stop. So he shakes the cup. Can you help? Can you help a fellow out? Then the oddest thing happens. Just, just see this as it happens. One of them says, hey, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I was raised to, to look folks in the eyes. There's, there's something about uh, a connection when you, when you stop and you look someone in the eyes. Oh, today we get all, you know, we hide behind our computer screens and type things on our social media pages that we would never say to someone's face. And here, Peter says, hey man, look at me. You can't see compassion if you're not looking in someone's eyes. You can't see love if you don't take time to look in someone's eyes. And Peter just says, hey man, I don't have any cash. Remember the early church, they, they were sharing everything with everyone. Nobody really had excess. He says, I, I, I don't have the book, but I've got something special I am willing to give you. And at that moment, as this man comes to know Jesus, everything in his life changes. This, oh, from a theological uh, uh, standpoint, the new creation breaks into reality. Remember, Jesus said, I'm making everything new. That newness pours on top of this guy. It changes everything for him. Uh, Isaiah talked about this in chapter 35. He said, then the lame will leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will sing for joy. This time, as Jesus is starting to make everything new again, and we have to remember that you and I live in the already and the not yet, so we live in that time where the new creation is coming. We see this happen, no, but it's not, not, not completely the, there yet. Now, 
I imagine somebody's asking, why in the world would you preach on this passage in a vision series and honestly on our commitment Sunday? Here's why. Because this is what the church does. If Thrive is going to be a church of any significance, we have to let this passage move from our heads to our hearts and into our hands. We have to let this sink into our bones. Now, here, 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 here's the thing, and I'm just going to be honest about this. I, uh, when it comes time, we talk giving, and, and I would say if you're visiting with us today, I'm, I'm not asking for any, in, anything. The church isn't asking for anything from you. We want you to, to see God's love. Um, for those of us who this is home, we are committing as, as we're going forward. But I don't believe in heavy handedness. I don't believe in manipulating on these types of things. Uh, we've just been saying this all along. If you see God at work in this, if you see God at work in this, uh, our task is to pray to see how, how we would be involved. Let him deal with our hearts. To deal, he knows what we have and what we don't have. Let him deal with that. And in this text, there is a bunch more than what meets the eye. There's something special about this name of Jesus that Peter talks about. There's something special about the people of Jesus as they go about the work of the church. So before we as a church commit to moving forward, commit to what we're going to be a part of as we go forward as a church, there are six reminders here from the text that I'm going to very briefly hit, and I, I told my wife that I had six points to, to, to the sermon, and she was like, oh, good gravy, no. Um, re remember the, the Senate minority, or the House minority leader that went on for nine and a half hours the other day? Um, I'm not going to replicate that, I promise. Just six thoughts that we need to keep in mind as we consider the church. The first one is this is the church is designed to engage the community naturally and consistently. You see what happened here? Peter, Peter and John, when they, when they became Christians, they didn't stop what they were doing. They didn't say, hey, now we've got to go get away and be away from people. If we're Christians following Christ and we don't know any non-Christians, we're not really following Christ. Because consider where he would have hung out. Uh, one of my favorite Lutz, uh, uh, quotes by Martin Luther is a, a guy came to, to know Christ and he, he came to uh, Dr. Luther and said, hey, what do I do now? He goes, well, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a cobbler. He said, great, go make a good shoe and sell it for a fair price. If we're going to be Christians, our task is to be Christians where we're at. Engage the community. And if we're honest right now, we are a Sunday-centric congregation. What we do is surrounds a lot of Sunday morning, and I am going to promise you this, by summer that will not be the case. Not by adding programs or events, but by prioritizing and creating opportunities to live life, to live the gospel out in front of others. This is going to be our focus going forward. The second one is this, is the church is an answered prayer. Not the church prays for uh, 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 prayers to be answered, but we need to remember the church is already an answered prayer. Funny thing about this text, it, it, it mentions the gate, but then it says that it, everything happened in Solomon's colonnade. There's a reason why that's mentioned. If you were to go back to 1 Kings 18, all the way back in the Old Testament when the, when the first temple was dedicated, Solomon prayed that the strong name of God, the name of God would be here, and that there would be praise that happened here. And it's not all these hundreds of years later, guess where this happens? Solomon's colonnade, all these hundreds and hundreds of years later, it's at the place where Solomon said, Lord, I hope that this is a place where your name is and where your name is praised. Luke's reminding us now that this is an answer to prayer. Church, uh, Dan read this text earlier, but when, when you and I unite in purpose, we're an answer to the prayers of Jesus. He prayed that we would be one. He prayed that we would work as one, that we would experience the sort of oneness that really even the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit 
and joy. When we operate as one, we're an answer to his prayer. For, for those of you who know a little bit more about Thrive in the story, it's, it, it, Thrive is, is technically a replant. Uh, it's a replant of, of, of a church that, that had been around since 1927. And I talked to three of the previous pastors, and all three at one point had prayed that something like this would happen. And as we sit here, I, I recognize that this isn't something that we're doing, but that we are an answered prayer of prayers that happened a long time ago. Prayers that, that have led up to this moment. How many of you can think back in your own story and think about people that prayed for you as you were coming to Christ or that were leading you? We're not starting something new. We're stepping into something that folks have been praying for a long time. I personally, personally know of folks in California, Chicago, Houston, both York and Leicester, England, Bhutan and Ireland, and even a far off place called Kentucky where there are folks who are or have prayed for what we're doing here now. As we function as a church, it is an answer to someone else's prayers. We don't do things on our own. We're simply responding to the work that God's been putting together for a long time. The third one is this, the church is more but not less than the people. Think, think about this for a second. This kind of goes along with the last one, but think about it. Remember, God went to a man called Abraham, and he said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, and one of your great, 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 great grandkids is going to bless the whole world. And remember, he thought that that one son is the, the son of promise, the son called laughter, Isaac. And then he almost has to sacrifice him. But God steps in and says, hold on, hold on. I'll provide the sacrifice. I'm not like those pagan gods. I'll provide the sacrifice myself. That, that happened at the temple. By the way, top of Mount Moriah, same place. That's where this happened. So go forward from there because they're waiting for what's going to happen. Moses says, hey, keep an eye on the horizon. He's going to be a prophet like me. David comes along after that and he says, uh, he gets a promise, your kingdom. In other words, it's going to come through your family, David. Your kingdom is going to go on and on and on forever. Solomon comes in and prays that at the temple, the strong name of God would be praised Isaiah, years later, says when this happens, folks who are lame are going to jump like deer. John the Baptist, years later, says, there he is, that's him. The Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Peter and John, when they step into this, you realize they are clearly part of something so much bigger than them. But get this, but they still are required to respond. It's been going on for century after century after century, but Peter and John still have to have compassion, don't they? They still have to respond to that compassion and to say, hey man, I ain't got no cash. What I do have, man, I'm, I'm happy to give you. They still had to respond and to show up in a space uh, a particular way, and when they do, the God who's been behind this all along shows up in a spectacular way. You and I are part of something bigger than what we are or what we thought that we were doing, but here's the deal. The choice is still ours because we still have to respond to that. We have to take steps of faith. We have to be folks who are willing to act on compassion. We have to trust that as we take steps of faith and as we act on compassion, that God's going to be awesome. Here's the deal. God's always awesome. Our actions just respond to how much we actually believe that he really is. The fourth one is this. The church 
is God's agent of restoration. Think about this, this new creation. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to make everything new again. It is both physical and spiritual. They restored his ability to walk, but more importantly, his ability to be welcomed into worship and to welcome into the fellowship of other people. I have a, a, a friend that's a missionary in India, and he, he says, if you want to present a, the gospel to a hungry man, you better wrap it in a sandwich. If you want to get, if you want to demonstrate to folks that you really believe God is awesome, meet them where they are. Meet them in their need. And if you, if you pay attention to this text, the lame man was carried to the temple. He couldn't go in. He was carried to the temple. But after his encounter with the church, after his encounter with Jesus, he moves from carried to, to walking, leaping, praising God in the temple. He jumps over every one of those religious boundaries that the temple had put up in the name of Jesus. Let that sink in. Much more important than, than uh, uh, um, healing his legs, but don't, mm, don't miss it. That was important. But much more important was the way that he was restored to God's people. Pick up on something else in that. Because this is doing exactly what Jesus was doing. And just because Jesus isn't physically here doesn't mean that his authority and doesn't mean that his work don't carry on through his people. Now, that means that you and I have to be careful to care about physical stuff that folks go through. And care about their spiritual needs as well. We have to be willing to meet people where they are. We demonstrate that we care, we love them. And then when they ask, hey, why are you different? I say, because I know this Jesus. And let me tell you what he can do. You and I can't heal on command. I know that that, that happened here in the text and, and I know some may claim they can. You and I can't heal on command. Even actually, Peter recognizes this in the sermon, I think in verse 21. He says, hey, there is a time when restoration will happen. All of that is going to take place in the future. That being said, you and I can help folks and point them to the risen Lord and pray confidently that he is still compassionate and willing and interested. I would argue this. There are more miracles that happen today than what happened at this time. You and I just don't get to do it on command. But through the church filled with the Holy Spirit, it's happening not just in one place on a hill in Jerusalem, but it happens everywhere the church is, all over the world, all the time. Every time you see someone give their life to Christ, you're watching a miracle. Every time you see uh, uh, families restored, you're watching a miracle happen. When you see addictions broken, you're seeing his miracles. Along with that, he's still healing folks. And he's still doing amazing things because the, the God that did this is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Fifth one, the church brings worship where it is not. In other words, I, our task is to go forward because there are lots of places where there's worship not happening. You and I are created to be in a relationship with God. We're created for worship. There is a joy and contentment that happens in worship that cannot be replicated in the rest of the world. People are their most whole and their most content when we're built to do, or when we do what we're built to do. Augustine said, uh, our, our hearts are restless, and we'll continue to be restless until we find our rest in you. So it's not until we come to that point in worship that we experience the joy that God has designed for us. This guy on the side of the, the, the gate, he was hoping for a handout. A handout could have made him happy. A little more food could have made him more happy. But coming into a relationship with Jesus brought him joy. That resulted in worship. 
and others worshipped because of what was happening to him. Think about the way that that went out. Our task, think, church, this drives me nuts, uh, just to be honest. When we think of church, we think of a place, and we think of, hey, the work of the church, oh, I'm going to volunteer here. Our work is out there. It always has been, and it always will be. That's where the church, now, we still have to function. We still have to put together the pieces. They're still set up on Saturday night, and we're going to tear down after today. We need that. But our work is out there. And our task is to bring worship where it is not. To help create environments where worship can happen for folks who don't know anything about Christ. We live, first time in, in, in really our nation's history, we live in a time where there's an entire generation that does, has no relation or no knowledge of Jesus. Think about that. We've been given an opportunity to steward. And as we bring people to know Christ, as we introduce them to Christ, worship will happen in places where it's not right now. And there are folks who have the weight of the world on their shoulders. That will be lifted as they come to know Jesus as Lord and respond in worship. Because I'm going to tell you what, there is a contentment knowing that my God knows how this story is going to end that says I ain't got to worry about today. I don't have to worry about this capital campaign. This is his church. This is up to me. It's, it's screwed up already. I couldn't even get the, the introduction done right this morning. There are folks out there who have been, become disenchanted from the hypocrisy that they've seen. Then it pounds on us in a thousand different ways. And we get an opportunity to reconnect them with Christ, the real deal, and to watch his worship happens there. There are folks right now who are berated by, we live, we live in a world that is very angry right now. Think about the way we respond to everything. There is no more middle ground. We swing, swing to the end of the pendulum and just throw rocks from there. It happens in our politics. It happens in our homes. In Christ, we can say, hey, here's something that's genuinely kind. Here's someone who genuinely cares. Here's someone who's bigger than the problems of today. Here's someone where you can, you can uh, root your life in and experience a life that's different than anything you'll ever know. And you know what happens because of that? Worship. And you know what happens in worship? More joy, more contentment. More people see and change lives. This is his plan. We better get this. We better get this one big time. The work of the church happens on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday at work when you're ticked off and your boss is being a jerk or uh, your spouse is uh, yet again or this or that. That's where the work of the church is. When we think of our ministries, it needs to be what's happening out there. Good thing is, is the Bible says we don't, we don't have to have a bunch of programs to do it. All we have to do is be willing to live out the realities that he's given us. Last one is this. The church proclaims Jesus. I know that seems pretty obvious, but this is the paramount. There is one name under heaven by which people can be saved. We can give folks parenting ideas. We can give folks financial ideas. We can give folks uh, ideas for how to deal better with your coworkers. We can help you to climb the corporate ladder better. We could do all of that and fail miserably. There's one thing that this world needs more than anything. And it's not a thing. Forgive me, it's a person. It's Jesus. That has to be ultimately, ultimately, think about what happened here at the temple in Solomon's Colonnade. People are amazed because this guy's walking. They recognize what's happening. And Peter says, what, you, you think I did this? No, it's Jesus. Hey, church, what's the answer to every struggle that this world has? It's Jesus. 
Who has a relationship with him? It's the church. That means that our task is to get out there and to bring Jesus. Now it happens. It Bless folks' hearts, but we don't, I guess someone could come to Christ, but we're not going to stand on the corner with a bullhorn uh, like the pattern that we see here with Peter and John. We're, we're going to come and we're going to meet folks where they're at. Love them. When we build a building, it'll be with the intent, with the intent of meeting folks where they're at. So however this building looks, it will work with the folks. We want something where folks will come to it naturally. We meet them, we get to know folks. We can bring them to Christ because His glory is what the world needs. Think about what's been given to us. Man, I, I remember being a, just a, a little bitty guy learning in, in, in church, hide it under a bushel. Now I'm going to let this shine. It was true. That's why we teach it to kids. The work of Thrive, whether or not you commit to this going forward today or whether or not you say, man, I'm out. This is what we have to be about. And that's it. And if you don't know Christ as Lord, or you don't know him in the way that we've talked about, man, we need to have a call. We need to have a, a chat. We need to talk. Because I just want to tell you about this Jesus who changes everything. Would you pray with me? Lord, this is yours, not ours. Sure idea, not ours. Would you work in this room? Would you work in me? Would you work in us? And change us through worship. Or as we think even uh, the promise that this is for us and for our kids and for all those who are far off that, that, that you may open our hearts. Help us to be about your work. Help us to be a church that is uh, overwhelmed by your goodness, mesmerized by your love in a way that drives us outward. We love you because you first loved us. In your son's name, amen.